from the unreal to the real. Lead us from darkness unto light. Lead us from death to immortality. Reach us through and through ourself and evermore protect us from ignorance by thy sweet compassionate face. Let us sit quietly a few moments and meditate on the Supreme Spirit in any way we please. Padrankarnevishrunyamadeva 
Padram Pasi Ima Akshapiri Ajatra Stira E Ranga E E Sturjuvagam Sastanu Vihi Yase Madeva Hitai Yadayuhu Om Shanti 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 May we hear with our ears what is auspicious. May we see with our eyes what is auspicious. May we enjoy with strong limbs and bodies the life allotted to us. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us all. So the title is Swami Vivekananda, A Message for These Times. So it is appropriate, first of all, to mention the traditional view regarding Swami Vivekananda's origin or the beginnings, the, the uh, visions that Sri Ramakrishna had about him before he met him actually physically that uh, told him the character or the, the quality of the personality that would come to him. So the first vision or intimation of the character of Swami Vivekananda that his teacher had was that his mind rose to a very high level and seemed to be traveling. He had a vision of himself traveling into higher and higher realms Exactly how to interpret that is not quite clear, but anyway, the point was into ever more spiritual realm, you could say. Exactly what that was, of course, only Sri Ramakrishna himself would be able to say. But this is how it's described, his mind traveled to an ever higher spiritual realm in which beings lived or appeared who had ever higher conceptions or understanding or realization of the basic reality of this universe, which is described in the Upanishads as given various names, Brahman or Atman, that the essence, the essence of all things, the reality at the heart of all things. Anyway, Sri Ramakrishna's mind traveled into this sphere and uh, he found himself, as he says, going beyond the realm of name and form. And there he saw seven sages Seated in, seated in meditation. Now, of course, you, you shouldn't ask too many questions here. If one goes beyond the realm of name and form, of what is the meaning of seeing these seven sages, which obviously were in some way form, had form? But that is Sri Ramakrishna trying to explain to us something which is basically not explainable. You have to put it into words, you have to use some sort of a communication that we can understand. So he phrased it that way. But the idea was to show that this realm was a realm where the understanding of the spiritual essence of things was very clear, very profoundly experienced. And in that realm, he came 
to one of the beings who was manifesting there, and he asked him to come. He said, the earth is in need, come and help. And that being actually was supposed to be Swami Vivekananda. Anyway, that the, according to the recounting of these events, that being did not actually answer Sri Ramakrishna, but gave what is interpreted as an, an, a look of agreement of assent, assenting to, the, to do this, to obey this. So that is the realm <clears throat> which was natural to Swami Vivekananda, whatever, however you want to interpret the precise recounting of the story. Nevertheless, he belonged to a realm in which truth, reality, the essence of things was not a mystery. It was very well experienced and very well understood. In this realm in which we live, <clears throat> we have many expressions that we read about this spiritual essence, this reality, but we simply read that as a story. We don't, we can imagine, <coughs> we can imagine uh, what that must be like. But it, for us, it is an imagination. For someone who lived, who comes from that realm, it is an actual experience. So whatever that was, however you want to interpret that, uh, that message or that recounting of that story, it, its main purpose is to show the level which was natural to Swami Vivekananda. For some time he was here on this earth doing ordinary things, but he really belonged to a realm where, the, where this truth is much more, or is very clearly perceived. That was his natural place, that is the meaning of the, of the story that is told about him. So when such a being who has experienced and understood reality at a very fundamental level, at a very essential level, when such a being comes to our earth and lives with us here and moves and uh, speaks and teaches, we have to ask what is the exact significance of what he is displaying for us? What is the real message that he has come here to give? He has no reason for, for himself to come to this earth. If we believe in the idea of reincarnation, which is clearly enunciated in the Bhagavad Gita, the idea is we have not finished what we wanted to accomplish on this earth, and we're taken away, let us say, at some point in our trajectory in this universe. Is that the end of everything? No, the Gita tells quite specifically it is only an interlude. It is not a period, it is a comma. It is, it is maybe not even a semicolon, it is just a comma. In other words, it's an interruption in a process that we are undergoing. And what is that process we are undergoing? we are intended to realize God. We're intended to experience the reality of the spirit, that this visible universe, this experienceable universe that we dwell in, that we were born into, that we are devoting so much effort into, that we have 
so many questions and uh, relationships uh, that all of this is intended for some for a purpose and it's not very easy for us to determine what that purpose is because we become very adept at concealing the reality from ourselves. And the reality is expressed very clearly in such scriptures as the, as the Bhagavad Gita, as the Upanishads, as the Bible, as all the sacred books, in some way and in some fashion refer to this spiritual reality. Everything else we can do ourselves, we think, and we have been fairly successful. Everything that is needed to live in this world, we have managed to be able to make some progress for, toward. It's not perfect, it's not finished much. Uh, you know, we're still not at that goal, but we've made a lot of progress toward it. But there is one aspect which is much more central to our life than that, though we don't always understand it. But at times we realize it. It's not the physical and intellectual parts of our lives that are really central. They seem to play the loudest and the most uh, intrusive role in our lives. But again and again, those who have realized these high truths have told us, whatever happens in this world is not intended to fulfill our needs in this world. It's intended to make us aware of the fact that there is something beyond which this particular, which the surroundings that we're in and the things that we normally do, do not reveal at all, but which powers them. Our desires, needs, and aspirations we think are powered by conditions on this earth, but the great knowers of this reality have told us what really powers us is the desire for immortality, the, the understanding that we are by nature infinite and eternal. We, the body comes and goes. The mind is either more adept or less adept, more capable, less capable. But these are all surface phenomena. There is beneath the body and beneath the mind, there is a reality which never changes. That is our own inner consciousness. That is our own inner existence, our own inner uh, significance. Our life is meant to understand that. And until we experience that, we cannot reach ultimate satisfaction. We cannot reach the end of this experience. We will, according to the ideas in the, expressed so clearly in the Bhagavad Gita, until we reach the infinite and the eternal, which is at the very core of all that changes, at the very core of our being, until we reach that, we will have to try again and again. So this, but Swami Vivekananda came from the realm, such a rarefied realm, where the understanding the realization was no longer clouded, where that experience was a reality. So from that realm he has come, and from time to time spiritual, great spiritual souls come and tell us that there is such a realm and that is the realm that we are supposed to reach and to appreciate and to understand. So whatever, Swami, whatever the idea is, so the, the title is Swami Vivekananda, a message for these times. And that message is the ancient message 
of all religions that what you see is a surface phenomenon. What, what we experience is a surface phenomenon. At the heart of everything that changes, at the heart of every perception, there is a reality which never changes. The infinite and the eternal, and that is called God, the Spirit, Brahman, Atman, whatever name you want to give it. The great souls who have experienced that truth give it different names, but the references to that same reality. We are all climbing mountains in order to reach something. We don't know what it is we're trying to reach. We have a, an idea of intermediate goals, which we think are our final goals, but when we get there, we find that it's only an intermediate goal. Ultimately, what is it that we're after ultimately is to understand at the heart that in the core of our being, there's a reality which never changes. In our heart there dwells God, the infinite, the eternal, the unchangeable. What we see, what we think about, everything is a representation of that, a manifestation of aspects of that. <clears throat> that is what the religions of the world tell. But they all proclaim that there is a reality which does not change, which was never born. It always existed. Time itself is a manifestation within that. It never came into existence. It always was. And that is what is within us also. The reality within us is not, was not born at a certain time and experiences life for a number of decades and then marches on. At our center, at our core, there is that reality that is given so many names. But its one characteristic is, it is an un, the unchangeable. It was never born and therefore it can never die. It never appeared, so it can never disappear. It is the essence of things, the unmovable, the unchangeable. So that is the message that all these spiritual teachers proclaim. There's the ancient saying from the chapter four of the Bhagavad Gita, yada yada hi dharmasya, Lanir Bhavati Bharata, whenever dharma, that is righteousness, declines, and then unrighteousness begins to assert itself and or continues, grows, and uh, becomes predominant. There is a self correction that takes place. It is the, the very rise of this adharma, the very rise of this uh, negativity brings about a, the manifestation of that ultimate reality in every age. So in every age, there is this mes same message. The surface phenomena are useful for life on the surface. For the life at the essence, for the essence of things, there is the unchangeable reality. Ultimately, that should be our goal. So that is the message that all these great souls that come to this earth are delivering. Now, how did Swami Vivekananda do that in particular and what? way. I would say that if one wants the, uh, to get, understand something of the essence of his teachings, of course you can look anywhere in the uh, nine volumes of his complete works and find a highly inspiring uh, and highly seminal uh, 
uh, topics being discussed and being very clearly explained. But if uh, one had to pick one or two things out of all that wealth of material, what would one pick? So everyone will have his or her own choices there. I would think that two, basically two lectures that he gave uh, are very fundamental and very uh, sort of a summary of, or a clear exposition of the message that he was trying to give. One is a lecture called God in Everything, which was delivered in London on the 27th of October, 1896. And the other one is a religion, I mean, is a lecture entitled, Is Vedanta the Future Religion? And that was given in San Francisco. Oh, when it was given, yes, San Francisco, April 8th, 1900. Of course, six days later, on April 14th, this Vedanta Society, Swami Vivekananda founded this Vedanta Society. So these two uh, lectures, I think if anyone is interested, they will probably find them highly meaningful. But I, I would consider them to be very fundamental to what the, to the, the message that Swami Vivekananda was trying to give. And uh, in this message, in this lecture, God is everything, God in everything. Actually, it's about the, uh, the, the inspiration for that is the first verse of the Isha Upanishad. The Isha Upanishad is uh, one of the few, very few Upanishads that are part actually of a central part of the early section of the Vedas. So it is considered one of the very oldest of the Upanishads. And it's, its first verse is, uh, explains the essence of Vedanta, the essence of reality, you could say. Isha vasyam idam sarvam, that is the first, uh, that is the first phrase. Isha vasyam idam sarvam, idam sarvam, idam this sarvam all. All this, what is all this? Isha Vasyam, all of this is to be covered, to be clothed, to be enveloped by what? Isha, by God, the, by the Lord. Everything is to be seen as enveloped by God. That is the basic message. So that uh, Swami Vivekananda's lecture title, God in Everything, is taken from that Upanishad, as he himself says, which, which is the basic uh, concept in the Vedanta exposition of spirituality, of religion. Everything that appears to be changing should be seen as essentially God, the infinite, appearing to us in this particular way, appearing to us in that particular way. So this, uh, it says, Isha vasyam idam sarvam yat kincha jagatyam jagat. Whatever jagatyam, in this world, jagat moves. Whatever moves in this world is to be seen as pervaded by God. That is the essence, the heart of Vedanta. In other words, the, that 
everything that moves, everything that changes, should be seen as being pervaded by that which never changes, which can never change, which is the essence of things. And how is one to think of that? <laughs> that in a, uh, in a practical sense, one way of approaching it, of course this is a, from the realm of science, and I don't know how much that will be appreciated in general, but the idea is that science describes that which changes. <clears throat> and it describes in a, in a great detail, in with great precision, ever-increasing precision, science describes what changes. But in order to describe what changes, you must take recourse to one particular idea which never changes. So at the heart of science, <laughs> you will find religion. At the heart of science, God is present. Why is that? <laughs> Not in the sense of God as, he, as God is normally understood, but in the sense of something unchangeable. At the heart of science, which, uh, who, which is expert in describing the changeable, there is one entity which is absolutely necessary to describe that which changes. And that is something which never changes. Namely, it's very simple, very obvious, the coordinate system. Without the presence of an unchangeable coordinate system, you could never describe anything that changes. <clears throat> so the existence of the changeable inherently assumes that there is something unchangeable. Otherwise, we would never be able to recognize the changeable. So you describe, whatever you describe, you say, it is, you make yourself a, an X, X, Y, Z axis or R, theta, phi or however, whatever system you want. And you say from the origin of coordinates, which is a purely imaginary point, uh, this thing is located so far along the X axis, so far along the Y axis, so far along the Z axis, and then you reach that point. And this other thing is described this way, and when these two things interact, this happens, and uh, all of science uh, describes things in that way. But in order to describe the changeable, if you did not have an unchangeable coordinate system as the basis of the description, you'd never be able to make any, you'd never be able to communicate that information to anyone else in a reliable way and experiments would not be reliably reproducible and all science would fall to the ground. <laughs> so this is the basic idea. The existence of the unchangeable is an absolute necessity for us, even though we don't recognize anything as being unchangeable in our normal experience. But the whole of religion is a call to that, to find this unchangeable reality at the heart of our experience. That is the meaning of God. It's that which is totally reliable, that which, is, which will not change no matter what happens to us. And that which is absolutely necessary to explain our existence. So in that sense, this coordinate system well, this idea of a coordinate system is a very profound, very profound notion that nothing is explainable without assuming something which is unchangeable. So, but the, uh, the lecture is God in everything. In other words, at the heart of everything that changes, there is this unchangeable reality. 
Isha Vasya Miram Sarvam. So all, all of this, this whole universe, every experience is to be seen as penetrated by God, the infinite, the eternal. Magritha Kasya Svidhanam. That's the next phrase. Do not uh, covet the wealth of anyone. In other words, be absolutely satisfied with that realization, that seeing that reality at the heart of everything that changes, be absolutely satisfied with that because that is the essence of things. Do not covet anything else. In other words, it's a it's a prescription to concentrate on that infinite, to give up that which is finite. So the idea, then Swamiji explains, I mean, the lecture is very, uh, you know, very full of so many ideas. So in in a uh, in in a presentation like this, we can't take the whole thing. But uh, certain basic ideas I wanted to mention. One thing that uh, he says is, we must work. Ordinary mankind, driven everywhere by false desire. <clears throat> what do they know as work? False desire means the previous phrase, Magritha Kasya Svidhanam, do not desire anybody else's wealth, do not desire that which belongs to others, but <coughs> the emphasis is do not desire anything. Anybody's, that which does not belong to you, that which is not inherent and intrinsic to yourself. Do not desire anything except that which is inherent and intrinsic to your own self, and that is your own reality. That is God within. That is that which you already have, which you already know, which you do not have to get, which is part of your intrinsic nature. So the idea is being, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Being intrinsically filled, being intrinsically uh, pervaded by that unchangeable reality, why should you want anything else? In the intermediate, in the interval, you know, for to achieve limited desires, we need to have limited facilities to accomplish certain purposes. But why should you yearn after something that you don't have? Because in your own heart is already everything. <clears throat> we need certain things every day. We need food. <coughs> so <clears throat> we will certainly desire food. We will desire company because that is part of our psychological well-being. Our surface life requires certain things. We will need those. But essentially, we need not, we, for our essential well-being, we don't need anything. For a temporary, if I'm hungry, I need food in order to fulfill it, in order to feel satisfied. That is all right. But nothing basic, nothing fundamental is lacking for me. My essence, Isha of Asya, my essence is that Isha, is that divine reality, is in my essence. I should see that divine reality within myself. That means that essentially I don't need anything. So give up desire in that sense, that fundamental need for grasping onto things in a fundamental way, it is not necessary. We already have that fulfillment. That is what the Upanishad is telling us. 
And as uh, the Buddhists emphasize desire uh, as the essence of uh, that which binds us, the essence of our dissatisfaction, and that is the same idea. Really, we don't need anything. We should feel within that whatever need we have is only for the maintenance of the body, it's a temporary, or the maintenance of the mind, the maintenance of our uh, daily life. We need certain things, but nothing fundamental is really required. We have that total, we should have that total fulfillment. That is the idea. Magradha kasyasvidhanam, do not uh, yearn for the wealth that belongs to others. Why not? Because you don't need it. <laughs> you already have everything. So then Swamiji said, when we have given up desires, then only shall we be able to read and enjoy this universe of God. Then everything will become deified. Nooks and corners, byways and shady places, which we thought to be dark and unholy, will be all deified. They will all reveal their true nature, and we shall smile at ourselves and think that all this weeping and crying had been but child's play, and we were only standing by and watching. As far as work is concerned, karma yoga. Swamiji, this lecture goes on. So do your work, says the Vedanta. It first advises us how to work by giving up the apparent elusive world. What is meant by that? Giving up the apparent elusive world, what is meant is seeing God everywhere. In other words, right now we see the world, we see everything seems to be that which is apparent. Something we seem to need this, we seem to need that, we seem to be having this goal and that goal. And that is only a superficial phenomenon. Seeing God everywhere, thus do your work. Desire to live a hundred years, have all earthly desires even if you wish. Only deify them, convert them into heaven. Have the desire to live a long life of helpfulness, of blissfulness and activity on this earth. Thus working, you will find the way out. There is no other way. There is no other way means we've been trying. If we believe, if we accept the theory of reincarnation, we've been trying life after life to achieve so many things and we come back to this earth again and again to to achieve things but the point is give up all earthly desires because you don't need them thus working you will find the way out so this is Swami Vivekananda in the lecture is God every, in everything. Of course, there are many other aspects to this lecture, but we will go on to the other lecture, which he delivered in San Francisco, April 8, 1900, as I said, and it's called Is Vedanta the Future Religion? And basically, Swami Vivekananda says, well, he doesn't know. I mean, he says it may become the religion of certain aspects, certain subsection of humanity. Uh, it, it has been the religion for uh, thousands of years in India of a certain uh, subsection of people. But uh, it will become a significant aspect in our lives if we understand it properly. That is what the point Swami Vivekananda is uh, trying to make. 
he says certain religions generally have certain requirements. First of all, they have a holy book. And then they have a holy person. And then uh, many of them believe that their way is really the only true way. So then it, 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 Swamiji says, well, what about Vedanta? Well, of course, in, in one sense, we have a book. We have the Upanishads. We always go to that. In another sense, we have a person uh, because we choose a spiritual ideal to be our own, uh, you might say, our own intercessor, our own uh, way of approaching divinity. So we, there is a personality involved. And uh, we do, uh, superficially, we feel, no, this is a correct way, and all other ways are different expressions of that same way that all religions really are talking about the same thing, all these ideas we have. But the point is they're not the absolute, they're not the essential. Even if all the scriptures were annihilated, if for some reason all books disappeared, this knowledge which is central to the Vedantic presentation will not disappear, nothing will happen to that. It cannot move, it cannot change. And though the, these ideas are expressed in books, and the books, uh, the Upanishads, the, uh, the Vedas are considered essential and holy, but they are not, they're an accessory. They're a, a uh, partial presentation that will guide us to that which cannot be expressed, which cannot be printed, which cannot be, <clears throat> which is beyond ordinary expression. So the books are not, it is not that the book itself is an essential part of the religion. The book is a, an arrow pointing to the essence of things. And where is that essence of things? Within ourselves. It is already there. In principle, we do not need any books. In principle, we are, in a sense, our own teachers, but in practice, it doesn't work. In practice, we can't find that path. There is a path going there, you could say, from where you are to where you want to be, but that path is part of hundreds of paths, hundreds of ways, and which path is going to lead you to that goal. And then we do need a teacher to explain to us that but we need all these things. <clears throat> Swami Vivekananda explains, you know, the basic needs of each religion. We do need all of that. He makes a point, though, that though this is on the surface, these things are required, Essentially, we do not need anything. Essentially, everything that we want is already within. The consciousness of the infinite and the eternal, the consciousness that death is a mere phenomenon that doesn't affect us in any essential way, that is already within. That is already, you know, that is, it may be expressed in books, and books are referred to, I mean, I came here, uh, carrying three books, and someone said to me, well, I don't know if you can manage to read all these books in this one lecture. So, uh, you know, <laughs> we use these books as props to uh, support that which is beyond all books, which can never be expressed in books, which is inside our own being, which is in our own hearts. So it is, the books themselves are not essential. It is what they point to that is the essential. So this, uh, so uh, Swami Vivekananda in this lecture is Vedanta, the future religion. He makes this point that in order for it to become the religion of many people, in other words, a, a widespread, for Vedanta to become a widespread religion, there has to be these certain understanding has to be there. 
uh, that what is essential is already there. <clears throat> and the apparatus that is described is a means to turn our attention to that which is essential. But it is the essential that is the uh, reality that we have to cultivate. Anyway, it is, it is a long lecture, <clears throat> and uh, I don't have time to go into the, you know, all the details. <clears throat> but I, I think uh, the message this morning is supposed to be Swami Vivekananda message for these times. And I think in these two lectures, God in everything, and is Vedanta the future religion, we have a very good <clears throat> summary of Swami Vivekananda's thought and realizations on this subject. So, uh, the point, another point that should be made is that while he was in San Francisco, where he delivered this lecture on future religion, he was in a very high uh, spiritual mood in which he was uh, apparently, as far as we can tell, directly respond, directly aware and actually living the experiences that he was talking about. And that is, the, that is the message. The message comes not in believing, but in doing and following and uh, becoming the reality that we're trying to achieve. But whether we realize it in its fullness or not, this is the, the, the emphasis that Swami Vivekananda had because he himself was living in a very high spiritual mood in which he was immediately aware of the, what it is that he was talking about. <coughs> He wrote a letter on April 18th, 1900, from San Francisco to Miss McLeod, one of his longtime devotees from the early days of his stay in America, and she uh, followed him and other ladies, uh, Sister Nevedita and so forth. They they all uh, followed him to India and. Uh, in so many ways. <clears throat> anyway, she, uh, he wrote a letter to her in which he explained his, his uh, you know, state of realization at the time as feeling completely uh, immersed in that divine reality and as though drifting in the will current of the mother, as uh, he was saying. So the things that Swami Vivekananda said anyhow came from a divine source. But it is sometimes said that in the, at this period of time in San Francisco and just after that, he was in an especially inspired mood. And so this is just to put a context on what he said, that this wasn't simply a lecture that he was giving. It wasn't simply a, a letter that he was writing. It was something that he was actually immersed in, that he was actually experiencing. It wasn't, it had no idea, it had no element of the theoretical about it. It was, uh, the way he actually perceived things. So if one remembers that, then one can study some of these lectures with great uh, attention, knowing that 
This is a subject which is very difficult to demonstrate to us, but Swami Vivekananda in, was in such a state, such a mood, <coughs> that he was actually able to uh, transmit some very clear conceptions of this essential reality at that time. There will be no lecture next Sunday, <clears throat> May 29th, because of a special online program on Monday, May 30th, which is Memorial Day. <clears throat> okay, okay, okay. <clears throat> Uh, now, you may remember that on Memorial Day, every year we used to have a very large program in our retreat in Olima. <coughs> <coughs> and uh, the last few years we haven't been able to have that because of the coronavirus infection. And we've had to have it online. And again this year it will be online. We hope possibly next year, through the grace of circumstances, through the grace of this little creature, which is called the coronavirus, which is a thousand times smaller than a grain of sand and which has upset the whole universe. Anyway, through the grace of that virus's benevolence, we hope next year to be able to have this. Uh, our regular Memorial Day program at Olima, which involved, you know, a series of uh, lectures and classes and uh, attended by hundreds, literally hundreds, our attendance usually was around 600 or more on that Monday. Anyway, this time it will be online. Uh, on Monday, May 30th. Then uh, there will be no Sunday evening online class this, this evening since Swami Tathomayananda is out of town. The next class will be held on May 29th. On Wednesday evenings, we have Vespers with meditation at 7.30 p.m. in this auditorium. There will be no Bhagavad Gita class this Friday at the Old Temple. Class will resume the following week on Friday, May 27th. Oh, here's an announcement about Memorial Day. This year we will observe our annual Memorial Day program online once again because of the surge in COVID cases. The program on Monday, Memorial Day, May 30th, will be from 9 a.m. until 12.30 p.m. and will comprise of two talks, one by Bobby Coleman on Vedanta and contemporary education in the arts and sciences. The other talk will be by Swami Tathamayananda on the Gospel of Sri Ramakrishna, a guidebook to spiritual life. Each talk will be followed by questions and answers. So I think that means that it will be online. I don't know what the format is, but you, you'll be able to uh, ask questions. I'm not sure if it's uh, by voice or whether you have to type them in. Anyway, there will be a question and answer session or several question and answer sessions. Yes, next year we hope to resume our traditional Memorial Day program at the Vedanta Retreat in Olima, Marin County. At present, the bookshop and library remain closed and childcare is still not currently available during lectures and worships. 
your cooperation in being fully vaccinated, wearing a mask, and maintaining six feet of distance is greatly appreciated. If you would like to make an offering, a collection plate will be available on the cart at the door as you exit. There is also a mounted offering box near the auditorium door in the foyer. You and your friends are cordially invited to attend all of our services. After the lecture, there will be a question and answer session today in Vivekananda Hall, and all are welcome. Om Dyo Shanti Antariksham Shanti Prithivi Shanti Apo Shanti Roshadaya Shanti Vanaspataya Shanti Vishwe Deva Shanti Brahma Shanti Sarvam Shanti Shanti Reva Shanti Sama Shanti Redhi Om Shanti 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 Om Peace is in heaven Peace is in the sky on the earth and in the waters the herbs, the plants, and the trees are full of peace. The gods are peaceful. Everything is pervaded by peace. May that infinite, universal peace enter our soul and being. Om, peace, peace, peace be unto us all. <laughs>